Hey, thanks for joining everyone. My name is Dominique and we have the rest of the Greenleaf team here with us today. We have our two hosts, Dave and Josh, and helping drive this live stream, we have Natalie. So to begin, we are going to conduct our end of quarter, uh, specifically fourth quarter, closing out 2021 market review for our residential portfolio. Um, and then to start, uh, really, most of you are probably not new to Greenleaf Connect, but just for our new viewers and uh, investors here on this call, Greenleaf Connect's mission is to be direct, informative, and transparent. And really, this is an opportunity for investors to discuss uh, their specific investments and portfolio here with us at Greenleaf, uh, any questions related to the property, um, overall strategy. We host both live streams and private connect events. Live streams like this one are open to the public and private connect events are typically tending to a smaller audience and a little more intimate. So today what we'll be covering is really changes in the market and in our portfolio all throughout uh, the fourth quarter. We'll discuss uh, delinquency trends, our reserve balances, and then uh, something very new to this particular Q&A session is we will be discussing and addressing specific questions on a property-related property, property related level. So this is your opportunity to pull out your end of quarter reports. And if there's anything that stands out or anything that you want specifically a little more detail on, we're happy to answer those. All right, without further ado, I will pass it over to our hosts, Dave and Josh. Thanks everybody. All right, thanks Dominique. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We're excited to go through just some quick points on the fourth quarter and then dive into what the, you know, how the properties performed and, and what everything looked like uh, for this quarter. So a couple of high level points here. Uh, the eviction moratorium has ended, but that has, we have not seen any uh, speeding up of the eviction process. So non-payments and long-term delinquencies are still very much uh, an issue market-wide. I don't, there hasn't really been as much news about that though. They said like the eviction moratorium ended and it was kind of like, oh, everything's normal now. Yeah, I didn't see a mass uh, spree of government hiring to yeah. help people get removed from their homes, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so non-payments are still definitely an issue. Uh, because of that, we're still seeing, and we've talked about this in other quarters, is this supply constraints um, because people aren't still aren't leaving if they don't have to. Uh, our apartment occupancy in residential really, it, it peaked at 97%. That's the highest we've ever been at, um, up from 90% at the end of 2020. And our average revenue gains, we saw almost 12% across, uh, across the portfolio on gains. And now we, I mean, we have a chunk that had no gains because they weren't paying. So that's, there's no gains on those. Um, and then just a couple other points here, uh, you know, mobile home revenues, we sold Creekside. That went into the fourth quarter. Uh, retention improved in the fourth quarter, but retention was overall pretty low yeah, for with, the year. With the sale of Creeks, I really helped to um, reposition our portfolio to just be focused on the north northeast Georgia market, which is really Gainesville, Winder, and Livonia, which is which have been the properties been outperforming the rest of the portfolio this whole time. So we're looking forward to the yeah. future of this. Our, our average group. cash distributions from that segment were around twenty five percent on equity for the fourth quarter for the, I mean, for the year, any of the fourth quarter. So that was very solid performing a uh, couple of properties we have there. And then we completed the refinances on Park Hill and Rosecroft. So we're going to touch base a little bit on the, on the properties as we go through that too. So overall impacts for apartments. If we look at what transpired this quarter, we mentioned delinquencies and these are continuing to rise. And it's really from our, uh, but we're kind of calling our permanent non-payers or super non-payers where we have people in these buckets, the gray, red, and blue sections. There's people that owe over $2,500, 5,000, and seven people owe over $10,000. This has continually risen throughout 2020. We had a little bit of a slowdown between Q2 and Q3, and we were optimistic that that would stay there, but it did not. And we saw uh, these residents are, are continuing to have non-payment uh, issues. We had a couple of properties, so that did reduce, but the, the super non-payers are here to stay until we can get through the eviction process. And, and Dave and I were talking about earlier, there is some seasonality in, in delinquency, especially with that 
bigger chunk, that 225 chunk that we'll, we normally see that rise a little bit every year, this time of year with uh, tenants really choosing to, you know, celebrate the holidays with their family and spending money on things other than rent. And then they normally get caught up uh, with tax returns that normally get filed in February, early March so that they can catch this money up. So we're, we don't have, again, we don't have a lot of concern for that big chunk, the 225 chunk. And really a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people in the 60 chunk, most of those people normally pay out in due course. Yeah. Um, it's really just the gray, red, and blue boxes that are uh, our problem. Right, yeah, and that top, the top 20 residents owing over $185,000. So that's, yeah, so it's, of 2,000 total residents, we've got 20 of them that are not so great. But, so if we look at the same kind of thing for uh, the mobile homes portfolio, we see here we have, again, uh, we have our, what we're kind of calling the super non-payers. Those rates are a little bit lower in mobile homes simply because the rates are lower, but our top 10 here of $37,000. Uh, we look at really that, that group of 14, seven, and two people, so green, gray, and red sections. And that is the bulk uh, of people that are not paying and they really don't have any intention to pay. Um, when we look at barns, we had a big drop in barns. That's why that one's green. And that's where we actually had a lot of, we had one tenant that owed almost $10,000 that, that finally vacated. So that was a big win to get one of those people out. And having you know one person with that, such, that large of a balance really moves the needle when we're looking at our delinquencies overall. Right, and also you know the, the lower performing properties we sold over the year of uh, 2021. So we're excited to see you know the, the batch that we still have just perform well. The more stable. Yes. Yeah. So even with these things, you know, we're talking about delinquencies rising and our accounting method, we still look at things on a cruel basis, but from a cash basis, we still collected more in 2021 on these assets than we did in 2020 more in the fourth quarter than in the third quarter. So revenues were still growing even on a cash basis. I mean, we want cash is, cash is king. That's the most important part. Uh, but numbers looked even better on a accrual basis. So a couple just trends of what we're seeing. The, the super non-payers are back on the rise. Our eviction for non-payment, this is still, it's still very slow. We have gotten a few people out, but it's still very slow. Uh, and last quarter, really in the middle of 2021, we're talking about, we didn't expect to see more normal delinquency levels until the middle of 2022. Uh, we're sticking with that assumption, but it kind of feels like it's probably a little optimistic as well. All right, so we're gonna jump through uh, apartment occupancy. If you look at our overall occupancy, we talked about 97%. Uh, here's steadily grown every quarter going back to 2020. We really started pushing this information out there and the data on this uh, when the pe pandemic first got going. And we've been tracking ever since. And now, I mean, not that we weren't tracking occupancy, but now uh, focused on clarity and the reporting of it. And we had great occupancy growth in the apartment segment. And then when you look at the lower chart, all of our assets uh, are essentially full, like 95% occupancy is is basically full. You want to have a couple vacant units that you can lease and gain uh, the new market rents each time. So we saw large gains in all of our assets in the fourth quarter. Right. So. And and the, the, to um, elaborate more on what Dave was saying about you know some vacancy is uh, for example um, our east side crossing property uh, L thirty five. The average rents in the property as as people live there was give or take a thousand maybe eleven hundred. But as units came up on turnover, whether it was a delinquent person, whether it was just someone just moving out for more natural causes, um, we were getting $1,250, $1,350 on these new rents. That, that's really where we saw a lot of the revenue gains was on that turnover. So turnover has actually been very helpful in a moderated pace um, with these high occupancies and um, well-performing assets. All right, we look at... Um the mobile home occupancy, kind of similar trend we saw here, the, the dip that we see in Q4 2020, those are basically assets that we were selling. Uh, and then we saw seen occupancy rising uh, even in the fourth quarter and all of our deals are essentially flat on the occupancy front and Point South, we have, we have one person move out there. So Point South is a smaller asset. So it, 
one yeah. matters. <laughs> one matters. It's going to move the needle on the occupancy there. So overall, pretty pretty flat on the on the occupancy trend here. Um, now we're getting into the good part. This is uh, the reserve. So you all know our reserve strategy is what triggers our distributions. So if we meet our reserves, we're then uh, distributing cash above that. So across the board here, you can see our percentage that we achieved of our reserve goal. With some notable things on the far right here side, we have uh, Ocala, which is being sold. And then we have two, three of our QOZ deals that Fairway is, was the first QOZ deal completed in the renovation. It's had the most time to earn cash and, and come back up. And then we have Heritage and uh, um, the Grove. Heritage, we're looking at selling. So we're not trying to gain reserves there. And the Grove, uh, we're looking at a refinance there as we sure. finish the CapEx and more stabilized there. In the mobile home segment, you know, four of our deals are fully fund, uh, fully reserved and they made distributions. And then we have Barnes and Baker that are a little behind and they did not make distributions on, on this quarter. All right, so that's just a quick recap on how things went for the quarter and where we're at. We're gonna start with a couple questions coming in. We're gonna start with deals that uh, had a refinance on them. We're gonna go into deals that we had sales and then additional questions beyond that as we go really deal by deal uh, on what's happening here. So we're gonna get started with uh, refi questions out of the gate. Yes, so first question um, on City View refinance. Can you tell us a little bit more about the distribution that was received um, that was for the lender held COVID release? Yeah, so th this was, I think we were probably one of the first groups that had a lender COVID reserve. Um, when we did the refinance in City View, we did that at the end of 2020. We closed November, closed like November 18th of 2020. So we had one year from then uh, to release the reserves. And we got back $285,000 plus a little bit of interest. Uh, it's always, a, it's a little thank you, I guess. Um, but when we sent that money back, uh, originally, when we kind of sent out our announcements, we were like, look, we're sending $285,000 back. It's the reserve funds. It's capital going back. Uh, but when, when it trickles out, and if you look in your Juniper accounts, you'll see there's a portion of that that is old accrued preferred returns. And there's another portion that is um, return of capital. The return of capital amount was only about $94,000, $95,000. So the rest was preferred returns that are coming out of that. Okay, so our next question is on the Grove refinance. Can you walk us through that a little bit more? Well, we're that one's we've been working on that one. Yes, we we kind of keep waiting at the Grove because even if you look at your uh, cover sheet, the Grove revenue has really just been continually growing at the Grove. Sound the same? But the higher the revenue gets, the better we do there. The more the, the better the debt we can get. So we've really been trying to push this one out to the very end uh, so we can get the best debt out there. And so from a refinance standpoint, there's, there's, there's really two dynamics. One is property operations and basically have we reached the peak of property operations? And two is, is there an opportunity that property operations is stable, but we can take advantage of really the, the debt markets to improve our position. So the other refinances that we're looking at this year which are Kingstown, 1209, Eastside Crossing in the apartment world. These are all, all these have fixed rates in the high fours, which is really, really good long term debt. But right now we can get fixed rates in the three and a half to 3.8 yeah. range. And um, we can lock that in for seven to 10 years. So that's, that's really why these are on the list of, you know, can we opportunistically lower our cost of capital by 100 basis points on these deals? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, when we got the rates, we were pretty excited about them, but right. now it's even that's even lower. Josh and I have been talking about rates going up for <laughs> forever, you know, for longer than we want to admit, uh, and now it's it starts seeing like there's probably going to be some of that happening in the near future. They've at least talked about it. Uh, you know, nothing's real yet, though. Right. So, yeah, and it's really the same story in the mobile home world. Is uh, when we went into these mobile home parks, it was really a value add stabilization, and and you know, at the time it was more you know, for us to figure out how to operate these things and maximize the cash flows. 
Now with the properties that we have remaining, our average debt is in the low fives. And so we think we can basically pull them together, get a larger yeah. loan and uh, lower that cost of capital at least down to four range. Yeah, so I, I know we had some questions that came in on our Gainesville portfolio. And we do have our loans that are coming up uh, in 2022 there. So we have four assets in our Gainesville portfolio and then we have Beaver Creek and Point South. Uh, so if that's kind of lumping a lot of deals together right there. You know, that's six deals that we're lumping together. But on the cover sheets for those, for all six of those assets, uh, we performed very well and we were making distributions. So, uh, and I, on all those two, the average cash distributions are about 25%. That went out uh, in the fourth quarter on those deals. With that being said, they're performing very well, and we need to we need to go get the refinances done on those. So we had a very strong quarter, but all six of those we're looking at uh, taking out to the refinance market at one time, and that could be, you know, the the four Gainesville ones L zero twenty six. Those are lumped together. We could refinance those together. We could do them separately. We're going to do what's whatever gets us the best result from our rate and dollar wise uh, going forwards. But we're planning on holding those uh, mainly because they perform so well. As we have that information, uh, we'll do more of these and we'll, and we'll convey just kind of what the full refinance picture looks like. But that's probably second quarter. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. yeah we'll, probably, we'll probably find some debt options in the first quarter. We're putting the other the package. Mobile home lenders are a little different. They take a little more coaching. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're, we have to put together really a, a more robust sales package than a traditional apartment deal. Yeah. So... Okay, on other, other refinances that we, I know we've got some thoughts on are L035, which is Eastside Crossing, and 1209 Memorial. Uh, those two deals are, are deals we've had for a while. We've already done a refinance on both of them. Mm -hmm. So this would be our third refinance. And since then, like we said, rates have come down even more. Both 1209 and uh, Eastside Crossing made distributions this quarter. So they're performing uh, they're performing well and they're continuing to see revenue gains. But, I mean, we can refinance them and get even lower rates than we have. So we're going we're gonna to take advantage of that. We had a great fourth quarter with those two assets and, and looking into, again, probably second quarter on those two. Right. That we'll see something uh, coming out with those. Any other questions on uh, refi stuff? Not on refis. Okay. So the next part we're going to talk about as we go through our assets, we're going to go through uh, deals that are lined up for sales. Um, and just even when we sent out our, our fourth quarter reports, again, we sent those out on the 20th uh, this quarter. We plan to send those out on the 20th going forward every quarter. So you can expect your statements. You can expect your distributions to, to be sent out on the 20th uh, of every quarter. So on, on the sale front, we have... Uh, Oak Hollow. That's yep. in the that's in the gates right now. We are planning to close on February 23rd, but the seller possibly the, earlier. The, the seller would like to move up closing to February 10th. So um, we're asking for those of you who are in that deal. We're asking for your 1031 commitments really as soon as possible so that we can accommodate. Um, normally, when we, when a seller wants to move faster, we want to accommodate that. So um, for the 1031, we just had we need a little bit more prep time for that. Yeah. But overall, I mean, if you look at your, your cover pages for Oak Hollow, I mean, our revenue growth this year was excellent. And the fourth quarter was the best revenue quarter that we have had uh, since we bought the property. Not entirely hard. Some of those times we're, we're trying to get rid of people in there and there were some challenges with that, but uh, Oak Hollow is performing well now. And that really helps that sale process when a new buyer is coming in and saying like, Hey, they're making revenue gains. The property's working. Uh, it gives them uh, optimism that, hey, they can speed up their closing and get us. If they get it to February 10th, I mean, that's, that's pretty soon. Yeah. Yes. Right? Um, and then from there, we are going to have the 1031 options that go out for Ocala too. Yep. Okay. And, and, and then coming up is also Heritage Square. We recently went under contract with Heritage Square. Uh, about two weeks ago, buyers still under due diligence, uh, reviewing the property, doing their inspections, all the normal Thank course, you. and it's targeted to close on uh, March 14th. Uh, and right now, everything seems to be on track. 
and yeah. uh, we'll continue to report um, when we get when the buyer gets through their due diligence. We'll uh, we'll we'll definitely communicate more information about 1031s and and some uh, alternative options that we have yeah. as the close gets more Im- closing gets more imminent. Yeah, but we still have a month, um, basically a month and a half to closing on that one. Yep. So as we have other updates, I guess I, is their money hard? Not yet. Not yeah, yet. So we okay. about two more weeks of that. So we typically send it once their money is hard on that. That's when we, that's when we'll have the next mm-hmm. follow up communication on the on the status for Ocala. And again, that one's a, we, it's in the QOZ, but it is a mix. So we have we have fresh equity and we have QOZ funds in that Ocala deal. So there's some tax questions on here. What happens with a QOZ deal when we sell it? And as long as we take those funds and reinvest it in another QOZ uh, area uh, on the map, it counts and we get to keep our deferment going. Whereas the fresh equity part would have to do a 1031 to keep their deferment going. Um, So that's that's what we're looking at with uh, Heritage there. So we did have another question on Heritage Square is, what will we do with the proceeds from the sale as they can't be distributed? So there, there's two forms of proceeds. There's the QOZ proceeds, which yes, those have to be held and used for something uh, and also reinvested back into a QOZ area. The other part, the fresh equity could either be distributed or they could take their 1031 uh, options out of that. So exactly what we've done with the QOZ funds yet, we don't, uh, we don't know. We're trying to line up what our QOZ and really 1031 options look all at the same time. Uh, but we have in the QOZ, uh, we have the same time frame, like a 1031 to identify and place those funds. So it's not that we would get penalized uh, for not doing something with it. Um, but we know, I mean, we've done a couple deals recently that are in QOZ areas, but we weren't doing the thresholds. So we didn't do them as QOZ, as QOZ deals. Right. Okay. The, the other thing that we've looked at is, um, and we've done this on 1500 North Graham and on the Lupton building is we've looked at other creative ways to earn revenue on the property by continuing to invest in it. So uh, we've put solar panels on both of those properties. It was a relatively small investment. Didn't really have a major impact on the QOZ equity amount, but it, it was a good way to put, you know, 10 year money to work that earned revenue and produce returns. So we're keeping an, an eye open for opportunities like that on the existing assets we have in the QOZ to continue to invest into them that will give us better returns. I, th- I think, is that it for sales? Do we have any other questions on the sale front? Not on sales. So, yeah, and so you can look, we'll have continued information going out on the sales as we go through that process. So you, you can definitely look for more information coming on those. Okay, we can go into deals that have questions on operations. There's any that any of that uh, specific ideas yes. on those? Okay. Okay. So the first is on L36 Kings Kingstown. What are the plans there with there being no distributions or mention of a refinance? Yeah. So on two fronts there, if we look at the refinance option, I guess let's talk about the market where Kingstown is in to start with. It's right near L035 <laughs> and 1209. Those are two deals that are that are kind of right in that submarket. We've seen tremendous rental growth in that market. Uh, however, Kingstown has not necessarily been able to realize that rental growth. Even on the sheets, Kingstown has performed uh, with growing revenue, which is positive, but it's kind of like we're never able to catch up to what our reserve target is when we set that back in the beginning of COVID. So our reserves shifted really second quarter of 2020, first quarter of 2020. And Kingstown has been playing catch up ever since then and not been able to make a distribution. So the options there on a refinance, we'd really want to see even higher revenue to really maximize what we could get on the refinance. Uh, The other front is to get that revenue, uh, we probably have to invest money into the units and turn them over, talking replacing windows, renovating the interiors, and doing a heavy lift on the deal to really capture the revenue growth that's in the market. We probably have one of the cheapest living options in that market right now. Uh, so that's on the uh, agenda for 2021 is we either have to refinance this thing and reinvest the proceeds to really capture more revenue, or do we want to put additional fresh cash into it to do a big renovation uh, and then basically drive revenue from there so that we can get a better refinance? Absolutely. Hey, 
Our next two questions are gonna be on evictions and non-payers. So first, you spoke about the federal eviction moratorium being lifted, but what is the status of eviction bans in the various local residential markets we are in? All right, so we, we don't have any bans currently in place that are hard to get through, but what we do have, it's not necessarily a, a, a ban, but the offices and the sheriff's offices and the people that are in the government agencies that are processing these evictions, like they didn't get any added staff or resources or anything knowing that, hey, we haven't done a, an eviction for a year and a half now. And all of a sudden that backlog has hit the books and it's coming through. So all of the evictions are taking an exceedingly long amount of time to get through. So the bans are over, yes, but now you're kind of stuck with the operational consequences of decisions that were made a while, you know, two years ago. Yeah. Right or wrong, right? Those decisions were made. And now those agencies are playing catch up uh, to do that. And we're seeing that uh, across the board. It's worse in our bigger cities. Deals we had like Livonia, Georgia, smaller town, they don't have they don't have the backlog or they don't have the, the congestion that the bigger cities are having right now. Okay. Our next question is on non-payers. Do you expect to receive any cash for the non-payers like through collection agencies? And if not, do you plan to start reserving for the bad debt on the balance sheet? We do not plan to see much from them. We submit everyone to collections. So mm -hmm. anytime a resident moves out, we are submitting them to collections. Gosh, our, our, our overall collection ratio is maybe 1% on, what do you call money. that? Like lost, lost rents. I mean, we call it lost rents because they're, they're definitely lost. Uh, so we get about 1% of it back. So I, I, it's not a, not a meaningful amount that we do collect. And how we reserve, our reserve strategy is based on cash, not a, not a cruel balance sheet number. So our reserve is true cash. So we are reserving for that. When we see the big drops um, in revenue on the accrual basis, like, yes, we had a big write-off, and we, but that doesn't, that's not our actual cash position, which is shown in the reserves. Okay, the next questions are on delinquencies. So when you pulled up the delinquency page in your uh, slide deck, it it had two what more stable properties like Park Hill and Saddle Creek listed. Can you speak more on those delinquencies? Yeah, so that chart is really like a, a percentage change in delinquencies. So we look at a place like Park Hill, you know, it's on the list and it, and it has about 15,000 in delinquencies, but it's a 205, 205 unit property now. Um, so, but again, we, we just refinanced Park Hill. We paid out all of our press. We're all caught up for the 2021. And now going into 2022, we, we did see over the holidays uh, a rise in delinquencies on that asset. But I think that's, you know, what, what Josh had mentioned more on, on holiday timing of that stuff. Those are, we, we, we do not have like the super non-payers at Park Hill. So, and same with Saddle Creek. We do not have super non-payers there. And on a positive note, we noticed that Eastside Crossing had improving occupancy and rent. So can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the improvement there on, I would say it's more even improvement on economic occupancy because we had some big non-payers there that were able to move out. Uh, that, was our, that was our biggest accomplishment there. I think we had two people that were uh, 12 and 15 or $16,000 that moved out. Um, so that that greatly improves kind of what we're seeing going forwards there. And occupancy gains, I mean, that part of town right now, uh, you know, we're talking like more urban Atlanta uh, has doing very well. Rent growth and demand has been very strong there. So uh, it's been very easy to lease our apartments there. We actually, we had, we have a couple of properties that are all located near each other. And we had an office at Eastside Crossing and in, in this past year, we, we rented that out to converted that back to a unit and rented that out. So we don't even have an office on site. We fully leased everything out there. Those are all the questions that we've had come through so far. We will stay on the line for a couple more minutes. If you have anything, you can put that in the Q&A box in the Zoom presentation. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we hope this was helpful. We're really trying to just answer individual specific questions that come up as you're looking through cover pages 
or as you're looking through the commentary that we have on a deal or you notice something, uh, trying, trying to make sure we can address any of those kind of customer or, or interesting things that are noticed. Yeah, so we'll give it a few minutes if there's anything else. Um, yeah, overall, very, uh, very positive fourth quarter. Yeah. And lo lots of distributions that went out. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for joining. We appreciate your time today. And uh, we have a couple more this afternoon that are going through our various uh, asset classes with commercial or retail and the industrial flex ones. So if you have interest in those and also 1031s from some of these sales, the majority of what we're seeing right now in option wise is either medical, some government or uh, industrial flex opportunities. Right, we, we have a, our, our current buy pipeline is incredibly robust right now. We have five properties under contract with about five more in heavy negotiations to go live. And so we're, we'll be, there'll be a lot of communication coming up soon about not only those properties generally, but also how the 1031s are going to come and play with those. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.